We're back with our town hall with Senator Bernie Sanders. Let's take some more questions from our audience. All right, so we're going to go to Rodney. Rodney, are you up? Hi, Rodney. Hi. What's your question for Senator Sanders? Thank you. Uh, my question for uh, Senator Sanders here is, uh, how would you bring back jobs in industry uh, like Bethlehem Steel that have been lost due to, in part, uh, trade deals that don't favor the American working class? Hey, Rodney, that's a, a great question. <laughs> you are looking at a former congressman and a senator who voted, not only voted against NAFTA, walked the picket lines with union workers to see that... <laughs> voted against CAFTA, voted against permanent normal trade relations with China, strongly opposed the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And why did I oppose all of these disastrous trade agreements? It was very clear to me that these agreements on the Democratic and Republican leadership was written by multinational corporations to make these corporations even wealthier at the expense of the American worker. So let me suggest what is not a radical idea. American workers should not have to compete against desperate people around the world who are making a dollar or two dollars an hour. Now, I think, I think we have a moral responsibility to lift up poor people around the world along with the rest of the wealthy countries. But you can do that without engaging in a race to the bottom. I don't want, I have heard, you know, I have heard from, you know, I've got a 100% lifetime pro-union voting work, and I'm very close to the unions, and I talk to union workers, and they say, our boss has said that if you don't take a pay cut, you don't take a cut in health care, we're going to move to Mexico, we're going to move to China, where people are prepared to work for almost nothing. So we need a, trade is a good thing, but we need a trade policy that works for working families and not just for the large corporations. All right, so you just saw in, in uh, Peter Ducey's package there, people saying that they think the economy is doing pretty well here. So in, in Pennsylvania, you've got unemployment is down over the past couple of years. Wages are up 6.6%. So how do you convince those people in this area who I know you'd like to win over this time around that they should, you know, sort of Good. change horses and, and go with you when Good. things are going well? Okay, well, let's, that's a fair question. And uh, let's look what's going on, not only in the United States, around the world. I know Donald Trump will tell you that he is responsible for the relatively low unemployment, which we currently experience. Well, guess what? In 2010, at the heart of the Wall Street crash, unemployment in America was 10%. You remember that? Yep. By the time Obama left office, it was 4.5%. Okay? So it's gone down. And in the last two and a half years under Trump, it has gone down again. Where are we, 3.5% now? That's good. Okay, but there's been a steady decline. Do you know what unemployment is in Germany now? 3.1%. In Japan, it's 2.8%. In the UK, it's a hair higher than us. In other words, the entire global economy, thank God, mm -hmm. is bouncing back for the terrible, terrible Wall Street disaster that caused so many jobs and caused so much suffering in this country. Okay? And you said that has nothing to do with the Trump. No, certainly not. What I'm suggesting to you is the facts are very clear, is that in Japan, in Germany, United Kingdom, all over the world, thank God, it's a good thing, the global economy is coming back and unemployment is relatively low. Now, I know Trump will give a slightly different spin on it, but in the midst of all of this, in the current economy today, while unemployment is low, and we're all delighted by that, what you have is that most of the new income and wealth continues to go to the very, very wealthy. You have a situation now where 7 million more people lack health insurance that used to have it. And you still have a situation where in states all over this country, and it's hard for me to believe this, but it's true, you got people still working for $7.50, $8 an hour because Trump and Republicans refuse to raise the minimum wage to a living wage. So to answer your question, the economy today is good, thank God, but you got tens of millions of workers still struggling to put food on the table. And we've got to address their needs as part of let, the debate. Let, let me ask you, just a quickly, if you raise taxes on, on corporations, which I know you weren't happy with the tax cuts for corporations, aren't you afraid that that is going to chill employment, that those companies are going to say, you know what, we have 100 employees, we could do it with 50. 
We can do it with 60. We're not going to pay these higher taxes. We're not going to, you know, look, well, isn't well, that a If you want to defend, I mean, you know, you know we, I think we look at the world a little bit differently. But if you want to defend a tax system in which Amazon, owned by the wealthiest person in this country, pay zero in federal taxes. I don't think anybody thinks that's, that's fair. Okay, uh, good. But I'm saying if you raise taxes on companies, small businesses across the country, well, it's a, we you know, are, are you worried that they will employ well, fewer people? Tax policy is complicated, and you've got to do it right. You didn't hear me say we're going to raise taxes on small business, did you? What we are talking about is raising taxes on large, profitable corporations and on the wealthiest people in this country, and I think that that is just. Senator, uh, you look at the list, you're, you're for the Green New Deal uh, and different policies within it, but you're for it generally. Uh, we talked about Medicare for All. Can we talk about... Uh, yeah, we will. Okay. Uh, free college tuition. Yep. You have an infrastructure plan. Yep. We have a, a shot of the current national debt clock. It stands at more than $22 trillion, uh, tonight, and as we're talking here, it is ticking up. You've talked about ways to pay for your plans, but there is a lot of doubt um, that your plans might actually speed up that clock dramatically. So when you look at that, do you not care about that anymore? I think you're asking the wrong guy. Maybe it's the president you might want to ask. But, I mean, Brett, in all due respect, sure. Trump gave a trillion and a half dollar tax break to the top 1% and large profitable corporations. And I find it so ironic that my Republican colleagues in the Senate who talk all the time about the high, the debt, they don't have a word to say about that. No, okay. we've, we've done many stories about okay. that. Okay, I'm not, not, not a criticism, not a criticism, but what I am saying is that I'm we, asking you. Yeah, we in fact, I am concerned about the debt. That's a legitimate concern. Every American should be concerned about it. That's not something we should be leaving to our kids and our grandchildren. But we pay for what we are proposing. In terms of Medicare for all, we are paying for that by eliminating, as I said before, deductibles and premiums. We're going to save the average family money. When we're paying twice as much as other countries, we're going to save money on health care. I talked about a tax on Wall Street speculation that will help us make colleges, public colleges and universities tuition free. We have a tax plan to raise the trillion dollars we need over a 10 year period to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. So I think you're talking to the wrong guy. We pay for what we are proposing, unlike the President of the United States. We have another audience question. Amy is a therapist from uh, South Whitehall Township. Amy, uh, what's your question? There she is. Hi, I work as a therapist specifically with people struggling with opioid addiction. Pennsylvania is currently fourth in the nation for opioid overdose deaths, which amounts to 15 people a day in Pennsylvania. As president, what specific policies would you implement in order to address this crisis? Thank you. And thank you for the work you're doing. And let me say, you know, it's not just Pennsylvania. It's Vermont. It's New Hampshire. It is a terrible, terrible crisis. Uh, for the first thing, first thing that I would do is make certain uh, that we never allow Trump to implement his plan, which would throw 32 million people off of the health insurance that they have. Some of you remember, and, and think about what that would do to dealing with opioids. You may remember that during the campaign, you correct me if I'm wrong, you guys follow this stuff, President Ca Donald Trump campaigned, and he said, I'm a different type of Republican. You remember that? He said, I'm not going to cut Medicaid. I'm not going to cut Medicare. Well, the last budget that he brought forth called for a trillion and a half dollar cut in Medicaid over a 10-year period, $845 billion in Medicare. What would a trillion and a half cut to Medicaid do for our ability to combat the opioid addiction? So what we need, in fact, is we need a series of ideas to deal with this very, very serious addiction. You know, what the med we are facing a nation right now where our life expectancy is actually going down. And one of the reasons is drug addiction. It is alcoholism, it is suicide, which the doctors refer to as diseases of despair. When people are giving up on life, that's what happens. So what we need to do is to make sure that we have the treatment capabilities. 
which most states don't have. Actually, Vermont's doing fairly well in that. That means if you are, want to get off of that addiction, there is a place for you to go. It's difficult, it's tough stuff, but we have to deal with addiction in a serious way and invest in treatment for those who are addicted. For all of these plans, for all of these plans, you say there are enough taxes to raise to pay for all of the plans. Yes. There are bipartisan independent groups who have looked at those plans and say it just doesn't add up. Well, what do you say to them? We disagree. And sometimes these, these plans done by think tanks, check out who funds the think tanks. Yes. Okay. Look, Brett, Brett, here is the issue that we have to deal with. Let me just bring it down to a human level. We're the wealthiest country in the history of the world. That's where we are right now. Do you think we should be having the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major nation on earth? We got some moms here who are spending $15,000, $20,000 a year trying to find quality childcare for their kids. We probably have a childcare system which is more dysfunctional than almost any other country on earth. But we all know that zero through four are the most important years. You got hundreds of thousands of bright young people in America today, the wealthiest country in the world. They can't afford to go to college. And you got 40 million people struggling with student debt. Do you really think that we cannot do better as a nation? And on top of that, you got a handful of people who own more wealth than the bottom half of the American society. Now, I understand that we're taking on corporate America, we're taking on the Republicans, we're taking on the Democratic establishment, taking on the drug companies, taking on the insurance companies, taking on the military industrial complex. You know what? I think it ain't easy. I know that. <laughs> but I think what the American people know, the American people, I think, are ready to deal with justice in America. That's, that's what we're fighting for. And that's economic justice, social justice, environmental justice, racial justice. some questions about immigration. Oh, sorry, immigration. Immigration. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about the border. Um, it, the president, as you know, has said that the capacity for the asylum seekers that were full at the border in terms of housing and it's overflowing, yes. it's a bad, untenable situation right now. He has suggested, and it's been very controversial over the past few days, sending some of those people to sanctuary cities, which have said in the past that they have opened doors for immigrants, well, that they have opened doors for immigrants. So where do you, the overflow that we have no capacity for, where do you think they should go? Well, where should first they be thought, sent? first thought, I mean, this president, well, let me get, get into this, right? Talk, I talked enough about it. But what, we have a problem at the border, a serious yeah. problem. And what is the problem? The problem right now, and you correct me if you think I'm wrong, is that we are now seeing desperate people fleeing violence and misery in Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, mm -hmm. with little children walking a thousand miles. They're not trying to sneak in, correct me if I'm wrong, they're going up and they say, we want asylum, because I don't want my little girl to grow up, you know, to be treated horribly by gangs, okay? Now, you're right, there are a whole lot of people. So what do we need to do? We need sensible, immigration reform, which includes, among other things, getting hundreds of new judges, because the system is now overflowing, who can deal with these issues. You're coming into the country, are you really fleeing violence, or is another reason? Right. Okay, so you need to have many, many more judges to expedite the process. And new, new asylum laws? Pardon me? New asylum let's laws? Look, let's look, but I, you know, historically, from an international and national perspective, and I speak as a, the son of an immigrant himself, not in, in this kind of position, but who came to this country at the age of 17 from Poland without a nickel in his pocket. Internationally, what the world has said is that if you are fleeing violence, if your life is in danger, that other countries should welcome you in. But we need real comprehensive immigration reform. We don't need, and let me say this very clearly, we don't need to demonize immigrants. That we don't need to do. If you were the president of the United States, we have overflowing yes. facilities. 
They need to go somewhere because they're in that asylum what about process. Building Where would you put them? What about building proper facilities for them right now? Where? That could be done Where? I'm right on the border, right on the border at the same so time. So the people who live on the border should have more facilities in their states, but sanctuary cities which have said they're right, open listen. to accepting people should not take more. Now, this is a political act no, on the president. No, it's not. It's a real question. It's a real no, it's not a real question. Yes, it is. It's a political decision. So what you want to do, let's talk about immigration, yeah. which is a real issue. Okay, Everybody first like of all, instead reform. of demonizing immigrants, Nobody maybe, well, I'm saying you are, but we have a president who certainly does every single day. What we need is comprehensive immigration Absolutely. reform. That's what the American people want. And if we had a president who believed in that, we could actually do it. Yeah. What you also want to do, both, you know, you both got, parties need to agree on it. You to got today one point, you know, Trump ended the DACA program that Obama established. You know what that means? That means every day more and more young people who were raised in the United States from two or three years of age, they're in the military, they are teachers. They're working all over this country. They are now scared to death that somebody's going to pick them up and throw them out of the country. And that is what Trump did. We need to provide legal status to those people. And we need a humane... Look, Martha, I'm not saying this is an easy issue, right. but let's not politicize it. What we need, as I said, we need the proper... Uh, legal processes at the border so that these issues can be adjudicated to determine whether or not people should be entitled to asylum. And you didn't talk about a wall or security there, but you've talked about that before. We need border security. Of course we do. Who argues with that? That okay. goes without saying. Now, Let's I happen to, to believe, I happen to believe that there are more cost-effective ways to do that than simply building a... All right, let's go back to the audience. Tony is a real estate agent uh, from Copley, Pennsylvania. Has our next question. Tony? Senator Sanders, good luck in your campaign. Thank you. As a Syrian American, I want to be assured our country isn't going to partake in any foreign affairs that don't directly affect our national security. Yeah. I, believe, I believe we need to stay out of Syria, Venezuela, and other countries that have their own personal issues. Do you wholeheartedly agree with this sentiment, or are you going to become another cog in the war machine? <laughs> Well, Tony, thank you. That's an excellent question. And, you know, we don't, as a nation, we don't discuss foreign affairs quite as much as we should. Uh, Tony, you're looking at a guy who, once again, not only voted against the war in Iraq, I helped lead the opposition to the war in Iraq. And if you go back, go back to YouTube, and what I said then is that wars have unintended consequences whether it was the tragedy of Vietnam where so many people in my generation are still suffering as a result of that, people sleeping out on the streets. And by the way, we have got to make sure that no veteran in this country sleeps out in the street. <laughs> but let me, let me just say this. And this is, in a sense, good news, and I know you guys know this, that in the last month, uh, I led the effort along with Senator Mike Lee, who was a conservative from Utah. Mike and I led the effort in the Senate, and some really great people in a bipartisan way led it in the House. And what we said is we think that the United States should get out of the Saudi-led war in Yemen. <laughs> and, and for the first time since the War Powers Act was passed 45 years ago, we succeeded in the House and the Senate. And let me say this in a very serious way. I've been critical of the president all night, but let me just say this. The president has said that he does not want to see this country involved in endless wars, and I agree with that. And, Mr. President, tonight you have the opportunity to do something extraordinary. Sign that resolution. <laughs> Saudi Arabia should not be determining the military or foreign policy of this country. Let's get out of Saudi Arabia. Let's develop a bipartisan approach so that we do not continue to be engaged in, you know, wars like Afghanistan, which is, what, 18 years in that war. So. 19. So, from a foreign policy perspective, which country is the biggest threat to the U.S.? I don't know that I... Um, look, I, I don't like using the word threat because that says, oh, my God, we have to spend zillions more on the military. I'll, I'll give you an example. Clearly, you know, we are concerned about... China, and we're concerned about Russia. But here's the irony here. You got people who say, we need to spend even more than $700 billion a year, more than the next 10 nations combined on the military. You know why? Because that China is a real potential enemy. 
These are the same people who are investing billions of dollars building the Chinese economy. I find that somewhat ironic. All right, so I don't like to use the word enemy. Clearly, we need a strong defense. We need to bring the United States and the rest of the world together, do everything we can to rid this world of nuclear weapons. And I'll tell you what else, in my view, is a national security issue. And that is, we have got as a nation to reject Trump's idea that climate change is a hoax. <laughs> and you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the scientific reports that tell us that we have all of 12 years to significantly cut carbon emissions or else there will be irreparable damage to the United States and countries all over the world. So we have a moral responsibility, in my view, to transform our energy system and leave this planet healthy and habitable for our children and our grandchildren. And by the way, when we do that, we create millions of good paying jobs. Let me ask you one, because you brought up the question of emissions, and just one quick Sorry. question for you on emissions. Um, emissions. So you think we should el eliminate nuclear power, which I know they did in, in uh, Vermont, sure. but it ended up actually moving your emissions higher by 16% in Vermont because nuclear doesn't have any emissions. Think, honestly, I don't think that that's correct. I think we well, are moving. I, I can show you where I, I, I I'd like, yeah. I, that's, um, I can tell you that in so my city, nuclear... in my city, in Burlington, Vermont, which is the largest city in the state of Vermont, I believe that all of our energy is now renewable. That's something I started back, way back when, right. I, when I was mayor. Right. And other cities are doing the same. But Martha, here is the point. Here is the point. Yeah, I happen to believe, yeah, I, I do believe we should phase out, not eliminate it tomorrow. Yeah. We should phase out nuclear power plants. But here is the main point. The main point is that if we do not combat climate change, I, I fear very much the kind of world that we're leaving to our kids in terms of more drought, more flooding, more extreme weather disturbances, more rising ocean levels. And when those things happen, by the way, they become a national security issue because people migrate. If I can't, you know, if I'm living in the Mideast someplace and I can't grow food on my land, I'm going to pick up and leave, and that causes conflict. So, you know, you, you said, Senator, that you wanted a strong defense, but your yes. plan does call for significant cuts in defense. W would, that, would that send a message to the rest of the world that we are weaker? No, 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 no. We are now spending, Brett, we're spending, you know, more than the next 10 nations combined, including many of our allies. We're now spending over $700 billion a year uh, on defense. So we need a strong defense, but I will also tell you this. We have a Pentagon, and, and there are some Republicans. Uh, Mike Enzig, I'm the ranking member of the uh, Budget Committee. Mike is the chairman of it. And Mike, I think, and I are in agreement on this. He's a conservative Republican, that there's something wrong when the Pentagon is the only major agency of, of government that has not undertaken or, or completed a major audit. And there are very few people who doubt that there's a massive amount of waste and overruns. You remember John McCain, late John McCain would talk about the incredible cost overruns with, with the existing in the Pentagon. So I, I, we do need a strong defense, and I support a strong defense, but I don't support, you know, waste and profiteering uh, within the military industrial complex. So we're going to do a, a quick lightning round, if you a would. What? A lightning, lightning round. round. We, we try to do about 15 second answers. Oh, to I to hate this. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So All the right. first one is, is a very uh, serious question. You, you said yesterday, I watched your rally in Pittsburgh, that no one should tell a woman what to do with her own body. <laughs> with, with regard to abortion, do I'm you, sorry. With regard to abortion, do you believe that a woman should be able to terminate a pregnancy up until the moment of birth? Look, I think that that happens very, very rarely, and I think this is being made into a political issue. Okay? So I think it's rare, it's being made into a political issue, but at the end of the day, I believe that the decision over abortion belongs to a woman and a physician, not the federal government, not the state government, and not the local government. Senator, you are looking to become the first Jewish president. Yep. You're also a staunch supporter of Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, who even... Hold it, hold it, hold it. No. I've talked to Ilhan about twice in my life, so... But you've tweeted, I respect tweeted her, support for But her. this is what I do support. I support a 
a Muslim member of Congress not to be attacked every single day in outrageous <laughs> racist right. remarks. Sure. My question is that even some fellow Democrats had some problems, uh, have accused of you, that her of using language kind of associated with anti-Semitism. Can you understand why some yeah. Jewish Americans would have a problem well, with some of that? Yeah, I, I can understand. I think that that is not quite right. And I think that Ilana has got to do maybe a better job in speaking to the Jewish community. But if, you're, if your question to me is why I think she is anti-Semitic, no, I don't. No, it's not her. I'm saying in the thread in yeah, the I can Democratic understand. Party. But here is the point also. I'm Jewish. I lost my father's family, was devastated by Hitler. So this is an issue of some sensitivity to me. So I will do everything in my power, and I hope that every member of Congress will fight not only anti-Semitism, but racism and anti-Muslim activity so that we create a non-discriminatory society. But it is not anti-Semitic to be critical of a right-wing government in Israel. That is not anti-Semitic. Okay. Um, do you believe that that? Oh, wait, no. Do you believe that that murderers and rapists or thieves or child molesters should have the right to vote from prison? Good question. All right, this is in my state. It, it, I, I recently researched this. It turns out that in our constitution, in the state of Vermont, for hundreds of years, everybody has the right to vote. Okay. So I think you make this division. If somebody does something terrible, they're a rapist, they're a murderer, we send them away. Sometimes we send them away from life. But I also think that integral to who we are as Americans, no matter what kind of terrible things you did, you're paying the price. Maybe you're in jail for the rest of your life, but you have the right to vote. All right, and I'll tell you why. Once, one of the things, one of the things that upsets me very much is we have cowardly, Republican governors who are working overtime to suppress the vote, to make it harder for people of color, for poor people, for young people to vote. So once you start and say, you committed a crime, you can't vote. Or you did this, you can't vote. You did that, you can't vote. I don't like that. Every American 18 of age of older who's a citizen in this country has the right to vote. No matter their choice. What if they say the same thing about you, that you just want felons to vote because you, it will be better for you? Oh, come on. I mean, they could say the same thing, right? And you have done a scientific study to No, I'm just that. saying that everybody wants to, you know, encourage but look, voters look, look, and I discourage have, voters depending on, the, on where they sit. One of the great problems, one of the political problems that we're facing right now is the effort to deny people the right to vote. And look, I have run for office many times in Vermont. Sometimes I've lost, sometimes I've won. But I don't stay up nights nice trying to figure out how I can pe pe keep people from voting because they might vote against me. Uh, two more quick things, very quickly. We've been told that the redacted Mueller report, the redacted version of the Mueller report is coming out Thursday. Right. Uh, you don't talk a lot about the special counsel investigation on the campaign trail. Right. Why? Well, because everybody else is talking about it. You know, <laughs> look, it is what it is. It's coming out, I think, to the extent that as much of it as can be made public legally should be made public. I think the American people have a right to know what's in the report, period. Yeah. All right, I want to one question about somebody who may run okay. against you. Do you think that Joe Biden is a progressive? Look, I... <laughs> Joe is somebody who I have known for many, many years. Joe is a friend of mine. And by the way, I hope very much that in the Democratic primary, we got a lot of good people, many of them personal friends of mine, that we have a debate about the issues and not about personality. So Joe is a friend of mine. That's all I'm talking about. Do you, you think he's him? a progressive, though? He, he says he's a progressive. You see, you're trying to do that. No, uh, I, I'm not, not going to fall for that. Question. Joe is a friend. He will give his point of view. Okay. I give mine, let the people decide. So who they of like. the 20 potential Democratic candidates, do you have one that you think will be the toughest challenger to you? I have no idea. Today there was a poll that had us in the lead. Tomorrow will be in 18th place. Who knows what goes on? <laughs> we'll just do the best that we can. All I can tell you, what I am proud of, is in our campaign, media paid attention to the money we raised good. More important to me, we have over 1 million people who have signed up to volunteer. <laughs> All right, Senator. Thank you. Oh, we're yeah. going to give you the floor here for a closing statement. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. We want to give you a chance to give a closing statement.
We're going to give him a floor for a closing statement here. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I hope I wasn't too hot on you. That's all right. <laughs> we can take it. All right. All right. Look, um, thank you all uh, very much for being here. And thank everybody for watching. Just a couple of points. Uh, I think sometimes the divisions in this country get a little bit too hot. Okay? At the end of the day, we are all Americans who love this country. And I also think, and the media plays not a good role in this, and again, not just Fox, is we have a lot more in common than most people think we do. All right, poll after poll. Should we raise the minimum wage to a living wage? Yes. Should we rebuild our crumbling infrastructure? Should we make sure that our veterans get the health care that they have earned? Yes. All right. Should we make sure that we do not cut Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid? Yes. Should we give huge tax breaks to billionaires? Yes. You know, that's how most people feel. <laughs> so I hope, I hope, look, I'm looking forward to a good campaign. And the last point that I want to make, and I thank Fox uh, you know, for the opportunity of being here. And, and that is, I want to see our country have the highest voter turnout in the industrialized world, not one of the lowest. So no matter what your views are, get involved in the political process, stand up and fight to make this a better country. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator.